Father God, Lord, we thank you today for the opportunity we have to be here. We thank you today to know that you brought us here. And we thank you today that you're going to speak to us, that you're going to meet us where we are, and Lord, that we won't leave here the same way we came in if we allow you to meet us. And Lord, may we push aside the distractions and anything that would lead us astray from missing what it is that you would have us to hear. Lord, we ask that you would have your way from start to finish throughout this entire service. Lord, we pray these things in your holy, your precious, and your mighty name. Amen. Amen. I'm excited about today. I'm glad you are here. I hope that you're glad to be here. We are uh, we are in a series that we're calling The Road Ahead. We've been talking about how to push forward, how to keep going, and, and, and how that the road ahead oftentimes, a lot of times, is not clear, but yet... God knows what he's doing and that he directs, he leads, and he guides. And, and so we just finished studying and looking at a lady by the name of Esther. Today we are going to begin to look at another lady of the Bible, um, a lady by the name of Ruth. And so today is week one. Um, each week is going to be very different. Uh, we're going to pull some lessons from her life. Uh, we're going to gain some spiritual depth. Uh, and God is going to do something different each and every week. I do want to give you a, a heads up. Um, next week, I guess you would say, in this, if we're going to continue, Ruth, but in, in the latter part, we're going to talk about and look at, I guess you would say, part two of next week's sermon. It could be a two-part series. Um, the idea and subject of, uh, of single, of singles. If you know single people, you might want to get them here. If you are single, you don't want to miss it. But don't think for one second, if you are married, that it doesn't apply to you. Because it does. And one of the things, and more going the following week, this is only going to be the introductions to the second part of next week, and the following, we're going to be talking about marks of a great date. We're going to look at what it looks like, um, what you should be shopping for if you're single. That anybody? <laughs> Listen, some of you are like, well, I'm not single. Well... So what? People ask you your opinion all the time, and you want to give it anyways. <laughs> not only that, if you are not single, this is a perfect summer for you. If anything, maybe even more so for you. Because when we go through the marks of a great date, it's not what you should be looking for, it's what you should be. We're going to go through these things, and you're going to be like, yeah, I should be this. Ask yourself, am I this? Am I that? Am I being this for that person or the other person? You know, it's going to be it's going to be good. It's going to be great. And I believe that, Lord willing, we're going to grow from it. But uh, that's two weeks out. We're going to kind of start it next week. That's why I'm giving you a warning. Because I told you I would. Because some of you said I don't want to miss it. Some of you just look forward to it. And those of you who do, great. If you don't, get over it. <laughs> <laughs> so let's lay the foundation today. We're going to meet a family of four. And what we're going to do is we're going to learn a, a lot about their circumstances. That's what we're going to be talking about, it's circumstances. Today, I want you to hear me say something. We're talking about circumstances. I'm giving this to you up front, and I want somebody to hear me. I don't know who you are, but I believe that God wants somebody, a lot of you to hear this sermon, no doubt. It's for me just as much as it's for you. But somebody, you need to tell someone about this today. There's somebody in your life that you need to call, and you're going to need to tell them what God is going to reveal today. And it makes sense in a few minutes. But we're talking about circumstances. Circumstances. What is a circumstance, you ask? I'm glad you asked that question. Here it is. A circumstance is this. A circumstance is a condition, it is a state, it is a fact, it is an event that determines or modifies one's existence. Circumstances is very simple. It is things that change often. How many of you are used to dealing with circumstances? How many of you know life looks different on Monday than it does on Thursday? Yeah. There we go. I mean, I don't know about you, but it's like, can just we have a normal week? Anybody know? It's like everything is always changing, is it not? Circumstances are this. Listen, circumstances are your marriage or lack thereof. So, single, married, uh, children, no children, work, no work, the houses, your house, your vehicles. Your schools, your friends. How many of you know people come and go? There are people who were in your life that aren't in your life. There are people who have passed away, and there are people who are still there. There are people who you're friends on Facebook with, and then you're not anymore. You're blocked them. Congratulations. <laughs> there are people that you used to hang out with at work that you don't hang out with work. There are people you used to work with that 
you don't work with anymore, what's the point? Conditions, circumstances constantly change. Every one of us in this room know that. Where you were three years ago is not where you are now. Things change. And so here's the question that we should ask ourselves. How does God interact with our circumstances? The conditions and the state, that, that's what a circumstance is, that's constantly changing. Just how much does God get involved in this? I mean, let, let's be honest. Does, how involved is he? Does he? Does he wake us up in the morning and then choose whether you know we eat fruit loops or Reese's boots? Does he? Does he choose whether you put on the blue shirt or the green shirt? Uh, does he then uh, make sure that light was green and that one was red? Does, does he get involved in every single detail of your your morning and day, or is he pretty far removed? Meaning, like he he, he picked your birthday, he gave you. You know, gave you your your family, gave your, your mom and dad and your brother or sister, whatever that looks like, and said, good luck. You know, or is he somewhere in the middle? Meaning, maybe he doesn't care necessarily whether you chose, you know, Reese Groups or Fruit Loops, but he does care about the group you took to work. So, I mean, how involved is he? And this is what we need to talk about. And, and, you know, not too long ago, I went to, I went to lunch with a pastor friend of mine. And, uh, the waitress was, she was clearly not having a good day. Have you ever had one of those moments? It's like, you just know you need to get up and go to a different restaurant. I mean, she was not having a good day. I ordered a Diet Mountain Dew, and she brought me out coffee. Okay, Diet Mountain Dew, you don't mix those things up. Not too often. I ordered a, like a chicken sandwich. Uh, you know, it's gonna be great. And, and she brought me out chicken Alfredo. You know. She's not having a good day. She, she's off. And one of the clears cut, I guess you'd say, the final moment she knew she was not doing well, but her eyes were super poppy, and you could tell she'd been crying. She was still sitting there. She was struggling. And so, as my pastor friend and I sat there, we decided we should identify ourselves. You know, and say, you know, hey, we're, we're pastors, and we like to help. To tell her that, and as we did, she proceeded to bolt her eyes out. And she sat down for the next 30 minutes. Sorry, there were six tables. <laughs> <laughs> God showed up and transformed her life and her moment. And, and I bet the next table was very glad that that happened. But here's my question Was that my chance? No. Or was that God? I mean, no doubt. God had showed up in, in, in a mighty way, and I think that I think that what happens with us oftentimes is that we, we we have this struggle of how involved is he? Was that by chance, or was he really involved in all of that? Is that God, or was that just that just happened? So here's what I want us to do, and this is I want to I want to charge you on this, and maybe even lean in a little bit. When you guys do devotions at home, one of the greatest things you can do is be intentional. How many of you ever get bored reading the Bible at home? You don't have to raise your hand. I know you, you could raise it. I know you would. And sometimes it's, it's distracting. The TV, you know, you got your, you're backed up with your favorite TV shows, right? I guess it's the fault TV, I don't know anymore. DVR, uh, you know, you're backed up with your favorite episodes, and, you know, there's all kinds of noise. Plus, you just read the Bible, it just doesn't make any sense. One of the greatest things you can do is be intentional. And Today, what I want to do is when we begin reading Ruth, I want us to read this specifically looking at how is God involved in their circumstances? What, what is God doing? How much involvement is he in all of this? And maybe when you read on your own, ask yourself, okay, God, you know, show me. I, I want to see how you're messing up their life, how you're uh, interacting in their life, how you're blessing them. Or how so this is what we're going to do. We're going to see God's involvement in their circumstances. And we're going to bring it all forward. We're ready to start. Are you ready to start? Yes. 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 You guys ready? Yes. yes. Here we go. Ruth 1, we begin. In the days when the judges ruled, now, real quick, the judges were military leaders who had been raised up to rule. Uh, they, they, they were the occupying king, if you will, and they did a horrible job. If you, if you, on your own time, if you want to do some devotion time, check them out. The Book of Judges. You can read about them. These guys were horrible. There was an exception. You should check her out. Her name was Deborah, and she was great. There was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem 
of Judah went to live in the country of Moab. He and his wife, they had two sons, and the name of the man was Imelach, and their the wife was named Naomi, and their sons' names were Milon and Keline. And uh, how many of you are going to name your grandkids or kids that? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> They were Af uh, Aphrodites from uh, Bethlehem and Judah. They went into the country of Ohad and remained there. Now, Emelot was the man. He was the head of his house, and in this day and age, uh, they were up against the famine. The Bible says his family was hungry. And so as, as the man, he needed to make a decision. There was no food, there was no money, there was no harvest. And so he, he, during this time, there wasn't governmental assistance. There wasn't any kind of, there wasn't any resources for him to lean on at all. And so he had to make a decision. He had to figure out, okay, there's no food here. There's no harvest here. I got to do something. I got to go somewhere where there's prosperity, where there's money to be made. So he makes the decision to move. Now, this makes sense in the natural. It does. But where he's going to go is a very perverse country. This was a place called Moab. This was a, a pagan place. This was a dark place. This was not a good place. Matter of fact, Moab was a, uh, a direct result of a guy by the name of Lot. Now, Lot was a hot mess. How many of you know any hot messes? <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, you, you could really that. That's what I'm you hang out with. Anyways, he was a hot mess. This guy, and you know what his big issue was? Uh, he had sexual issues. Sexual immorality was his big thing. This guy was so messed up, he hooked up with his own kids. And so this was the city uh, that, that would have been birthed from this. So on one hand, I want us to get this. It makes sense to move here. There's food, there's prosperity, there's wealth. But on the other hand, this was spiritually no good. This would have been a bad decision. He would have been surrounded by, and his family would have been surrounded by darkness, pagan worship, and pagan influences. I mean, think about this. I mean, the, the sons, they would, have, they would have had pagan friends. The women, they, what, what would they have been? They would have, they, they, the women wouldn't have been godly. They would have been the opposite of that. And so, we do this, don't we? I'm talking about moving to Moab. I'm talking about making decisions without thinking them through. Oh, you're going to come out there already. <laughs> we make a lot of decisions without thinking things through. Because on the surface, it just, yeah, we like it. So we'll go here, we'll go with this person, we'll go with that person, we'll take this job, we'll take that job, whatever it might be. And we don't think things through. Now, some of us are the extreme of that. Some of us overthink things and we never do anything. You know anybody like that? And then we have people that, that shoot first, aim second. You know anybody like that? <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, I don't think these things through. It's like, oh, I should buy a boat, but I don't have a truck or anything to pull it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, anybody? It's like, why did you buy a fishing pole? You don't even fish. I like it. You know? Ah! We do this, don't we? <laughs> you know what I mean? Seriously, it's like Home Shopping Network. How many people have gotten in trouble with that? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just the way it is, and so we don't think things through, and here's our problem. Listen, you can tell me if I'm right. I know I'm right because I do this, and you do it too. We make decisions, and we didn't think it through, and then because we made that decision, we get ourselves in all kinds of trouble. We get ourselves in all kinds of trouble, and our circumstances change because we didn't think this through. We took that job not thinking it through. We made that move not thinking it through. And so let's keep reading verse 3. But Emelot, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two boys. Now listen, we see here, look right now, another circumstantial change. They moved from one location to another. There was a first change. Now there's a death in the family, and it's a big deal. So another circumstantial change. Listen, how many of you know this happens to us? Every day, circumstances change. Let's keep reading, verse 4. The boys, they, they took Moabite lives. The names of the ladies was Orpah, and the other was Ruth, and they lived there for about 10 years. Now, again, look, guys, another change, another circumstantial change. Uh, the, the boys get married. So it looks pretty good, right? For a second, we, we have a wedding. How many of you like weddings? Anybody? <laughs> really? <laughs> Nobody? The weddings, yeah, they play shout. Everybody shout now. Shout, 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 shout. You're dancing? No? <laughs> I'm the, don't, don't invite me to your wedding. Yeah. <laughs> I love weddings, right? There's cupcakes. Not only do cake anymore, they do cupcakes, which means you can have more than one. <laughs> and you don't have to wait for them to cut it because you can just go buy and grab it. <laughs> <laughs> but when you know it's a wedding, it's a 
great moment, but is it a great moment? I mean, remember, these weren't Christian ladies. No, they were Moabite women. And so they married, they married outside of their relationship, outside of their religion, outside of what they knew. These women didn't serve God Jehovah. They didn't serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were Moabite ladies. Now, what is the point? Again, another circumstantial change. Some of you sitting in this room, you get this because you're married to somebody on the you. You're married to somebody who, who doesn't know Jesus Christ, who doesn't serve the one true Lord. You know how tough your circumstances are. It's extremely annoying. It's extremely overwhelming. It's a struggle. And that's what this would have been. Circumstances change. Well, more change is coming. Let's read verse 5. Both Milan and Kelon died. And the women were, were left without her sons. The woman was left without her sons, Naomi, and without her husband. I want to stop for a quick second because I want you to see something. We have read five verses. Five verses, guys. And in those five verses, Naomi has been pulled from her homeland. She has lost her husband. She has lost her sons. And now she has two, in, two foreign daughter-in-laws. Things have definitely changed. And I want you to, I want to say this because maybe somebody needs to hear this. And I want you to understand this. None of this was Naomi's fault. I want to let that sink in for a second. Because some of you are sitting here, you're already putting yourself in Naomi's your shoes. And I want you to hear this very clearly. None of this was Naomi's fault. She didn't want to move there necessarily. She didn't make the decision to move there. That she wasn't her fault that her boys married these ladies. None of this was her fault. And listen, the, the point is this, is that the truth is, is that some of us are sitting here and this is where we find ourselves. Our circumstances are less than ideal. I, I had to pick a good word that was <laughs> recordable. Our circumstances stink. President Stephen. <laughs> the other one has to work. <laughs> the, 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 listen, some of us, that's who we are. Our circumstances stink, and we haven't done anything to deserve this. Our, our spouse is the one who, who chose to leave us. Our spouse is the one who chose to, to throw in the towel and, and, and don't want to work anymore on this. Our spouse is the one who emptied out the bank account and made the dumb decisions and the reason why we're broke. It's our kids' fault. They're the ones who keep making the dumb decision after dumb decision and that mistake after this mistake that we're having to deal with the issue we're dealing with right now. And you've done nothing wrong. See, some of you, you, you understand because you're still so frustrated. You did nothing wrong to deserve what you are going through right now. And if anything, you're trying really hard. But yet it still happens. This is where Naomi is. I want you to understand that. She has done nothing wrong. So what is she going to do? And where is God in all of this? Let's keep reading verse 6. She arose with her daughter-in-laws to return from the country of Moab, because she heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food uh, back in Bethlehem. So look, what did we just read? She sees a Facebook message. Uh, that's not how that went down. She got word that things were happening back in Bethlehem. I want you to see this. She had heard that there was no more famine, that God, not the rain, not the weather, not the judges, God himself had fixed Bethlehem, had fixed the famine, and that everything was all good and fine. Now, here's the thing. It's worth saying as we are moving forward. Look, we're identifying God here, right? Isn't it safe to say that if God's the one who fixed the famine, he's the one who maybe even sent them? But God's the one who was orchestrating all of these events for them to be in Moab, for those girls to be with the boys, and for what God is in control here. What is the point? God is constantly doing things that you and I fail to recognize in our life. And I, I, listen, I don't know who you are. I want you to hear this, and you will hear me say this again before we leave today. God is the one who is at work in your life. I want to encourage you right now. Some of you, your life is in pieces. Some of you, your circumstances are less than ideal. But I want you to hear me say something. God is faithful, and he is not done working yet. Amen. Your circumstances may be less than ideal. Things may seemingly be falling apart. But God is faithful, and he is still at work in your life. 
He is behind the scenes doing what needs to be done. He is. He is. And here's where it gets confusing, guys. I'm, I'm serious. I, I'm, I'm being as blunt with you because I feel that you're probably like me, that we are in this together. This is where it gets confusing. I mean, how involved is God in all of this that we are going through right now? Whatever it is that you're experiencing. I, God, really, what are you doing? Are you? Does God have everything to do with everything? Or, I like to say this, God has something to do with everything. Some of you just got confused. Let's say that again. God has something to do with everything. And we can solve this in two words. Two words. God calls us and God permits. I want you to understand these two words. And I'm so glad you're here. You're so much better and further than what I got <laughs> These two words as we go through Ruth are going to be essential. God calls us and God permits. Let's look at the difference real quick. I'm so glad you said, show us, Jason. <laughs> think, take, let me give you a couple examples. Uh, Noah and the flood. Remember that? Remember, uh, 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 Moses. Remember, remember, remember uh, Noah. I mean, with the ark. Remember he took in some animals and built that thing, and then God said, "Yeah, God took rain, something that already existed, and He caused it to flood the land to purge the land." So, so that that happened. He caused the flood. God caused Mary be pregnant with the birth of Jesus and the Savior of mankind. He caused her to be, the Bible says that he, the Holy Spirit overshadowed her and caused her to be pregnant. But you see, I want you to understand and get this. God calls us certain things. That's one hand. On the other hand, he allows certain things to happen. We see this all throughout history. We see this all throughout the Bible. Where he calls certain things and then he allows certain things. Let me give you a good example. At the very beginning of time in Genesis, God didn't cause Adam and Eve to sin. He didn't cause them to sin. He allowed them to sin. God didn't force sin into this world. But he allowed the act of will through sin to happen. I kind of wish you stopped that one. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? I mean, wouldn't it be nice to be living in paradise? Yeah. And then, like, like the Garden of Eden. Just imagine Bora Bora, right? Yeah. Everybody gets along, and it's beautiful, and it's gorgeous. Yeah, I wish you would have stopped that. But here's the thing. Many of us sitting in this room, we can attest to a lot of pain. We can attest to a lot of heartache, a lot of headache, and a lot of suffering because God allowed certain things to happen. Anybody? Yeah. Sometimes in this life, God allows us to make some mistakes. <laughs> Why, what, you understand? <laughs> Sometimes God allows us to make some mistakes. God allows us to do some dumb things. There you go, I got a couple more. <laughs> he allows us to mess up. He allows us to sin. Some of us, we know because of pain and drama that we have in our life, it is a direct result because of things that we've done, our actions. And God he never intended these things for our life, yet he allowed them. He allowed them and permitted them to happen. Now, this is where it gets confusing. Again, it gets a little bit weird, and it gets overwhelming, because if God could have stopped it, why didn't he? I mean, seriously, how many times have you, uh, has God allowed something to happen, and it's like, seriously, God, you could have stopped that. You let me marry that dummy, you know? <laughs> how many of us, God himself could have stopped it? How many of you would say that on some of our stupidity, right? Y'all are me out to try again. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Why didn't God stop this or that or the other? Let's be honest. I mean, if God could stop cancer, why doesn't he? I mean, if, 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 if he could stop adultery, why, why doesn't he? If, if he could stop the, that, that innocent people from being murdered, why doesn't he? If he could, if he could stop an accident from happening, and taking someone's life. And if he could uh, allow these kind, why poverty, why, the list goes on and on and on, right? God allows these things to happen. Why? Why do these things happen? This list goes on and on and on, right? And see, this is where I, I tell people all the time that the answer to this is simple, it's complex. It's complex because we don't like it. Mm -hmm. We don't like the answer. 
The answer seems too vague, too simple. And it's, it's actually answered through the prophet Isaiah. And it's a scripture I read too often. And I tell you, don't be numb to it. Don't be numb to it. Because we're numb to it. Some of us quote it and we don't even mean it. We're like, yeah, well, God, he operates better, higher than us. You can really believe that. And there's some of us here that will roll our eyes. Isaiah 55. The Lord declares himself. He says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. And my ways are not your ways, says the Lord. He declares it. He says, as, as, above, as high as the earth is, uh, the, the heaven is above the earth, so are my thoughts and so are my ways above your ways. What is God saying to you and me? He is saying, listen, you don't understand your circumstances. You don't understand what I'm doing. You don't understand why I'm allowing this thing to happen and that thing to happen. Why I, did not, why I didn't cause that to happen. Why I didn't cause this thing to happen. Why this thing didn't go through and that thing didn't go through. Why that door closed and that one opened. And see, we shake our fist at God so often. And what God is saying here is he says, I know the things you don't. This is one of my favorite scriptures. It's so therapeutic to me. Do you know why? Because I'm a train wreck who has no clue what he's doing. Anybody else? Yeah. yeah. My ways are pathetic. I have no clue what I am doing. They have three of you are with me. I'll come on this side. This is going to be a little bit I have no clue what I'm doing. All my decision making is horrible. I, I, I asked God a long time ago, please revoke it. Am I right to make decisions? Do you know why he can make this kind of promise? Because here's the thing about God. He has the ability to do something you and I don't. You know what it is? He knows what tomorrow looks like. He knows what next week looks like. He knows what next month looks like. He knows what next year looks like. And we have no clue. And so oftentimes what he does is, is he is setting things up today for next week. He's allowing this to happen because he knows what's going to happen tomorrow. He knows who's coming in your life three months from now. And so he's removing the things that are in the way. He knows the job that he's got in store, and so he's closing that door and closing that door. He knows the house. He knows the address he wants you to have, and so he's closing that thing, and he's closing this thing, and God knows what he is doing. Amen. God was there from the very beginning. He is the creator of the universe. He created it all, so because he was there from the start, he designed it. He put it together, and he holds it all together. So trust me, I got this. And you know in life, when life happens, what I'm saying is when circumstances change, when circumstances stink, it doesn't make it any easier, does it? I mean, I can tell you this time, boom, the face, and you're like, okay, Jason, that's great, but my life is falling apart. Mm -hmm. Naomi was there. She would have known this stuff. She would have known who God was, and she would have known that God was the creator and sovereign creator and, and God of the universe and had it all under control, but... It still hurt. She was husbandless. She was homeless. She was helpless. She lost her children. I mean, this would have been overwhelming. But God was still in control. You can rest assured it hurt. She was overwhelmed. And she had felt God was against her. And see, I threw this in at 9 o'clock. This was bonus. I'll get to you as well. Romans 8, 28. The truth is, is that, that all things work to together for those who love the Lord, that he is using all things for their good. I bring this up because I want you, somebody needs to hear this, because you're sitting here and you're already angry and you're like, I don't believe this because of what you're going through. Listen, God didn't tell you all things were good. Some of the junk you're dealing with right now, the loss you've had to experience, the, the trauma you're going through, the pain that people are causing you, the hurt that you're having in your relationship or lack thereof, the loneliness, the anxiety, the stress, the money issues, the health issues, the cancer, the chemo treatment, the listing of one. Not, these things aren't good. What God says is, is that he's using it for your good. That's what he says. He says, I promise you, I am behind the scenes and I will use it all for your good. You're my child and I love you. And I'm doing what's best for you. It's that simple. He's always behind the scenes. Because here's the thing. I want you to hear me say this. You can always hold God to his reputation. And he is a good guy. i got to get back to the scriptures because... Oh. <laughs> I know where to be. How about you? <laughs> we don't be off until 10.30 tomorrow morning. 
and we're taking a group, a group down to uh, from the church golfing, so pray for them. They're going to be on the bus with me. <laughs> Say, let's get back to the scriptures. We're about to see something that we're going to see throughout Ruth. It's something called dialogue. You're going to see a lot of that. Why? Because you have, that's what happened. You have women together. Thank you. Come on, guys. Let's keep reading verse 8 through 14. Okay. But Naomi said to her daughter-in-laws, Go return each of you to your mother's whole house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them and lifted up her voice, and they wept. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, No, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they can become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should have, uh, say I hope, have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait until they're grown? No, that's not happening. Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone against me. Then she lifted up her voices, and lifted up the voices of web again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth, she claimed to her. Now what we just saw was Naomi calls the girls together, and she says, I'm going back to Bethlehem. We knew that. That's coming. But she goes, I want you girls, I want you to get it together, and I want you to go find a man. Remember in this day, a woman without a man, a widow, they, they didn't stand a chance. She goes, I want you to go to Macy's, pick out the best dress you can find, just make up. You need to work it, girls. You know? She goes, you need to find a man. Some of you ladies are like, you do not need to find a man. <laughs> and this day, they did. They did. They, they needed to for their for their sake. And Orpah, said, Orpah was like, yep, I'm on the hunt. I'm going to find myself a fine man. She rolled out. Paul says she, she rolled out. That's exactly what it said. She was, only, she was ready. She was lonely. You know any one of the ladies over here? <laughs> so okay, that's what the, she was wanting to find herself, man. But look what the Bible says. Ruth stays with Naomi. Watch what she says. Let's keep reading. 15 through 18. And she said, See, your sister in law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister in law. But Ruth said, Do not argue with me. Do not urge me to leave you. Do not urge me to return from following you. For you, from where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God will be my God. Where you die, where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me more also if anything put death, death will part me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said, no more. Ruth just committed herself to leaving the land she knew, leaving her hometown, Leaving the friends that she had, the family, what family she had, she she determined to leave all of those things and go with her bitter, to put that in context, mother-in-law. Some of you can't get through dinner with your mother-in-law, right? And she is just committed to going with her on this journey. She just said, "Till death do us part." I heard a, I heard a groom one time read these words to his bride and said, "Your people will be my people." Your family be my family. Where you go, I'll go. He, dudes, guys, you'll never want up that one. I'm sorry. <laughs> what a powerful, powerful statement. Let's finish our passage for today, verse 19 through 21. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred up because of them. And the woman said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Myra, for the, uh, the Almighty has dealt with me very bitterly. Um, Went away. I went away full. She went away with her husband. She went away with her boys. But the Lord brought me back empty. Put these things away. Poor Ruth. She's like, what about me? You know? <laughs> no. Why well, call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Lord has uh, brought calamity upon me? I mean, I, I want you to. I want you to think about this, Naomi. I want you to see this. She is back in her hometown, and she is broken, she is hurt, she is sad, and she has literally changed her name. She changed it to Myra, which actually means bitter. That's what her name meant. She's like, I want you to refer to me as bitter. She comes back into town. Everyone is excited to see her. Everyone's excited. Have you ever been excited to see somebody? Okay, that was your moment to say, yeah, okay. These are new friends. Everyone was excited to see her. But when they encountered her, 
she had changed. She wasn't the same person. She was negative, nasty, bitter, and hurt. Have you ever met anybody like that? Is there anybody that you in your life that don't look at the person next to you? <laughs> they used to be happy, they're not happy. They used to, you're like, what happened? They used to be so lovely. You used to smile a lot. You don't smile anymore. You used to be sweet. Now you're nasty. You know anybody like that? Circumstances change them. Well, that's what happened with her. Her circumstances. See, this is, this is, there's like 15 sermons in this, by the way. Some of us need to be careful about the circumstances and what they've done to us. What kind of person they have made us. She's not the same person. She's depressed, she's defeated, and she says, don't even call me Naomi. I'm not even that person anymore. And so, God is, she doesn't know this, but God is about to take her darkest hour, this is the best part, and transform history. Some of you know what's going to happen. I'm talking history, baby, big time. All because of a massive disruption. History. History for all of us. <coughs> Our mind is about to be transformed because of a dark hour. And this is where we're going to stop this morning. And we want to figure out, well, what does this have to do with you and me? And I will have you on here in four minutes because, listen, I wrote three pages for this part, and now this is what I have. <laughs> that little bit. Because that's what God told me to do. He said, be quiet, Jason. <laughs> and I listen. And because here's the deal. And I told you, somebody, some of us need to hear this, but somebody in here, you're not telling me, you need to tell them, you're going to need to tell them these words. But some of us this morning, we can really identify with the only. This is where we are right now. We're broken. We're hurt. We're angry. We're bitter, we're sad, we're overwhelmed. Some of us, we would define ourselves as a hot mess. It's just a mess. Everything's a mess. We're barely holding it together. Some of us are sitting here and we feel like that God has turned against us because of our circumstances. And we hear, we hear us speaking this morning and we hear the words that are being spoken. But we don't believe it. And so you're here because you need to hear one thing. God is behind the scenes of your life. And he is piecing together all of these things that are seemingly falling apart to do his very best work Give you what you, need. you may not believe this, but it's the truth. It may not feel this way, but it is the truth. And that's why you're here. Because God wants you to recognize that even though your circumstances are not ideal, and even though things are falling apart in your life, God is at work. I want you to, I want that to sink in. God told me, don't you do all this other stuff. I don't want you to go through your points. I want you to say something very blunt and very clear. And whoever you are, hear it. Text it to the person when you leave here or call. God is still at work. Your circumstances don't look like it. Everything shows the opposite. But God is still at work. And if God is still at work, then it isn't over. And God is doing some of his best work right now. He's about to show up in your life and do something. He is going to transform, listen, he's going to transform your past. He is going to transform your future. And he is going to transform your life. Things change. And we know this. How many of you know that tomorrow is going to look different than today? I mean, everybody knows that some of us have, we're all, some of us have been dealing with things for a week. Some of us have been dealing with things for a month. Some of us have been dealing with things for years. And it doesn't make sense. I want you to hear me say this. Some of you are saying, saying, Jason, you don't understand. You're right. I don't understand. Because it doesn't make sense. 
And can I tell you something? I'm going to let you have a little secret. It probably never will make sense to you this side of heaven. But he knows what he's doing. And so you, you come back to this idea, okay, so what am I to do? This is what you're to do. You're to take away this truth. God is good, God is faithful, and he knows what he's doing. That's all you need to take away from this morning. If you fell asleep, wake up, this is all you need to hear. God is good, God is faithful, and he knows what he's doing. Regardless of your conditions, regardless of your circumstances, if things are falling apart. Can I tell you something? If things are falling apart in your life, God is probably doing something good. It's where he does his best work. Just read about it. It's where he does his best work. And so, I close with this statement. The gates of Bethlehem, they weren't closed to Naomi's bitter self. I, how many times do you wish you could, like, close your business or doors or, like, your office place? Like, you can't come in. You're having a bad day. <laughs> Is there, I mean, don't you wish you could screen people? Like, how's your attitude today? You just see it all over your face. Like, get the car go home, you know? <laughs> the gates of Bethlehem weren't closed to Naomi's bitter self. What's the point? I want you to hear me say this. Nor are the arms of God.